Now, I also understand you recently had a birthday. Yes, I did. So April did you 16th. do anything special? Yes, I went to dinner with some friends. Uh, I went to David Buster's, actually. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> It was so wholesome. It was so cute. Uh, one of my friends uh, won me a Pokemon. What's going on, Bias Webster out here? The man, the voice, the fragrance. And we're here with someone who, I guess, our schedules got crossed. We had to change, who I've been very excited to, to talk to in the past few weeks. Um, and is none other than Scarlet Sky. Scarlet, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing so well. How are you? I'm doing great. I now in researching you, there was something that, and I didn't want to leave off with this, but this is something that really struck me because I've never heard anyone in the adult industry say this in reference to what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I forget the gentleman's podcast it was a really good episode. You spoke about the connection you feel with what you do for work, and it can, the can connection you feel with your your co stars um and performing and that is not something i've ever heard anybody in the industry i never heard them refer to it as a connection and i'm sorry i'm a bit long winded but i'm explaining because us layman people uh -huh. we look at we we look at sex and, and being sexual with someone in certain ways but once you really go behind the veil of the industry especially you get to like a, a major production or whatnot it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more acting, there's a lot more production, uh, is a lot more uncomfortableness, not say you're shooting something for OnlyFans or something where it's just you and your partner or partners, you guys really can just do what you want to do, um, just make sure you got good lighting, good camera angles, um, you can't kind of feel each other. I can imagine with a set, it is a, a lot harder to really get into it. And when you spoke about the connection, that really struck me. Could you could you talk about that a little bit and what, what that means to you and how you express that? Right. So what you were saying is true. It is definitely a lot easier to connect with a performer when it's a collab setting, you know, because you're not taking nearly as many breaks. It's all on your terms. You know, you're, it's just you and that other person. You are just talking to that person for the rest of the work day. Whereas a studio, there are cuts and you're talking to the director and there might be a camera guy in your face. Um, but I still think making a connection with your co-partner, your co-performer is so important because I feel like one, it shows through in the scene and I, I feel like connecting and like really feeling something for your scene partner shows really well, you know, when you're enjoying the sex. Right. Um, but two, it's it's still acting in a way because you're still like putting yourself and channeling yourself into a mindset, right? It's not like I'm actually in love with my scene partner, right. but it's like anytime the camera is on, I love my scene partner. I channel this mindset that I want to make love to this person uh, or I get into whatever the scenario, whatever it may be. Um, I think that's half of the fun is just role playing and getting into that character. Um, I'd like to imagine that every scene partner that I'm with is like a real life experience while I'm having it. Interesting. And and I love the psychology because you have a degree in psychology, I can understand. Um, that approach to it but mm -hmm. even more so just reading a bio and listening to some of your interviews you are a real student maybe not in the total academic sense but a real student of, of human sexuality and, and intimacy in many respects mm -hmm. is is that that sort of curiosity and interest is that something that led you into the adult business Absolutely. Um, it's actually funny. Uh, back in high school, we had to do a presentation on what we wanted to do when we were older, uh, like after we graduated. And I went up to the front of the class and I literally put sex therapist. <laughs> and I did the, the uh, presentation about how I wanted to be a sexologist or a sex therapist. Um, so the field of like sex as a science, as a psychology, um, has always interested me. Uh, 
whether it be academics or whether it be by performance, I think definitely uh, it all went hand in hand. Uh, and this career is something that I considered back and forth so many times because of that. Interesting. I, I that's one of the things that struck me about you when I heard the conversation, because I know. In my friends groups over the years and even some of my discussions now. We discuss social things, but we discuss especially once. I think you get older and again, I'm I'm a bit of an older man. Like you realize you see things in different perspective than you did in your 20s as far as sex and sexuality. And it's interesting having those conversations with, say, uh, male friends or even female friends that are a bit younger than me and seeing a different perspectives of also hearing everybody's different experiences. And I, I think that what you talk about, even how you approach the industry is very worthwhile because I think we just, we forget that intricacy of sex and sexuality as far as who we are as human beings in many respects. And, and I think that's something that, in my opinion, when you look at the industry, you don't hear those conversations in a worthwhile setting. Because I think a lot of times it's all just, oh, it's, it's either put in two camps, like you like it, you understand it, like, you, you, you know, it is what it is, or, you know, it's repugnant. It's there's never in between. There's never real, in my opinion, a real discussion on right. possible benefits. There's always drawbacks with possible benefits, but also an expression of who we are as human beings and the sexual side of ourselves when, especially in 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 our country and, and regardless, I mean, in general, as far as we are, when you look at it, sex is everywhere, but it's not. It's really repressed um, in our conversations and viewpoints on who we are and what we are as sexual beings. So I, I, I really appreciate that, that attitude going into the business the way you have it. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, attitudes around sex are evolving and changing every day. Um, I think especially since uh, COVID happened and there was a big boom on OnlyFans. Yes. And when that happened, it was kind of like, you know, everybody kind of knew a sex worker at that point. And I feel like that kind of also changed attitudes towards like the industry a little bit right. and that kind of car started like the very first real discussion that I feel like we've had in a while because all of a sudden you knew somebody that was in the porn industry in some fashion in some ma manner in some way and suddenly that person's humanized right yeah no I agree I there are so many stories from COVID now that have come out uh remember there was one where again they aren't necessarily all good stories but there was one where this uh woman kids were expelled because she was advertising her only fans on the right. back of her car and that whole drama if i interviewed uh um which you shouldn't Alexi. do hmm? which so i know you definitely shouldn't do that just for safety reasons yeah i agree <laughs> <laughs> especially I, if you have kids I think that was in poor taste versus yeah. taste. Um, you are at a school. Yes, I understand the parents could be potential customers, but that's but just like is it worth like the extra like what like two, three subscribers, right. you know? Yeah, right. The, I agree, like I understand <laughs> that. I agree that there's a difference between just poor taste and bad decision making, uh, compared to just being stick, you know ostracized because you're 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 an only fans or you're you're a sex worker but you, we hear stories like that but we are hearing stories like that we didn't hear stories like that before so we right. have those stories in the general conversation in the discussion uh, uh one of the things some of my friends and i talk about we talk about the uh, some of the st stupidity and men and women say online when it comes to dating and there's always this well if she got her only fans and this and that again people have opinions and people have their own boundaries with regards to a relationship but my point is it's a conversation piece because it is a prevalent part of our society now that like you said everybody knows a sex worker or there's there's some sort of six degrees of separation uh, from someone who does some sort of sex work nowadays because of OnlyFans and the direct-to-consumer boom because of the pandemic. Absolutely. 
definitely agree. So I have a question. So I understand you have, I don't know if it's new, but I know you have a, a VR scene. What was it like filming for a VR scene? I love VR scenes. Uh, virtual reality scenes are some of the coolest scenes I ever film. I've worked with like Winx VR um, the most. Um, it's really cool. I there 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 are some cons to it, uh, but like the pros are um, first off, the technology is really cool. It's really interesting to see how it works. Like it it looks like um, those eye devices at the the doc the optometrist. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it goes right over the male performer, or right in front of the male performer's head, so you don't even see the male performer, which is interesting. Um, I really love it because uh, there's also a lot of improv, so it's just me okay. talking to the camera, which I think is just interesting um, and fun. Uh, but yeah, I would say the biggest con would be that I can't see my male performers right. so that sense of connection um actually funny story so that sense of connection isn't really there uh one funny example that happened recently was i was on set uh just a few weeks ago with nathan bronson who's another really talented male performer he uh i was saying like i was super excited to like Lee perform with him i was so excited to meet him and so he comes in and he's like i'm so excited to meet you i've been wanting to perform with you for forever i'm like oh my god me too and then the makeup artist informs us that we already worked together on their set like six months eight months ago <laughs> oh, wow. and it was a vr set but neither of us remembered it like wow we just didn't remember it. Um, it was a threesome scene, so I wasn't like the only girl, but like I, I barely saw his face. I barely spoke to him because there were other performers on set. So the sense of connection was uh, not there. All right. Let me ask you with that, with the VR, because you say you see the camera. Do you see yourself while you're performing? Nope. No. no, actually, um, no nothing? If you, so if you go behind the camera, and look through the lens though mm -hmm. like anything that's in front of the camera is like distorted and widened okay, out right. because it's a vr camera so it's like um, yeah 360 know, yeah, yeah yeah exactly um so because of that like if, even if i could see myself i'd look so distorted it wouldn't be like a true accurate um picture of what i'd actually be looking like okay but there's so much I was just curious because in that sort of setting where you don't have that connection, I was thinking, okay, if you could see yourself, maybe you'd be more so like a, like you can get, I'm just think of how you can get your head in the game, so to speak, and immerse yourself in the scene and, and really be the character without any sort of external t stimuli. So I, I can understand while it may be very fun, it could be very difficult compared to other scenes you would do. So that's a really good question. Um, I would say the way I do keep that connection there is through the, so the guy can't talk at all. Right. Um, he can only like talk with his hands, like do hand gestures. Um, so I think the way I connect is just by verbally talking. So I do a lot of dirty talk or um, I have fun with the role play and I, ha I say like really ridiculous things. Um, which is always fun. Like the more ridiculous, the better. <laughs> um, so I try to have fun with it and try to connect in other ways and try to get my own brain mentally stimulated um, if I can't get that connection from my partner. Understood. Understood. Now, I also understand you recently had a birthday. Yes, I did. So April did you 16th. do anything special? Yes, I went to dinner with some friends. Uh, I went to David Buster's, actually. Hey! <laughs> it was so wholesome. It was so cute. Uh, one of my friends uh, won me a Pokemon. That's awesome. I, yeah. I, I love, it's always the simple stuff, the stuff that brings you joy and puts a smile on your face is all that matters, especially on your special day. Yeah, I just wanted something low-key this year, too. I've been just so busy with work, uh, and I'm moving right now, so... I just wanted to hang out with my friends and just have a good time. And it was everything I wanted and more. 
Understood. I also understand you do a lot of writing. First, I understand you do a lot of journaling. What does journaling bring to your life? Oh, journaling gives me everything. Uh, it's thing I picked up when I was in high school. Um, journaling is something it it organizes my thoughts mm -hmm. and it helps me process my feelings and emotions. So I will feel scatterbrained about maybe like a small conflict I had or just how my day went, how an interaction I had with someone went. And as I'm journaling, it helps me process those feelings and that thought process, whether it's positive or negative um, in a healthy way. And it also is really nice uh, because you write about like the good, the small good things you did throughout your day. And it's right. always nice to look back like I, I'll have nights where I'll have friends come over and I've like showed them like an entry from like three years before where I was like, hey, this is where I wrote when I met you. Like I wrote about my first impressions of you, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they like it. They think it's cool. Uh, and I just think it's nice to look and reflect and compare how you felt about something in the past, how you compare, how you feel about it in the present. Right. And reflection is just essential, in my opinion. Now, does that aspect of your writing and that sort of reflection, does that bleed into your poetry as well? Hmm. Um, does that bleed into my poetry as well? I would say so. Uh, my poetry takes on a lot of different forms. I feel like some of my poetry is about what my emotions are, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes I actually will write about what somebody close to me is going through. And I actually find myself writing um, equally about like d digging into other people's emotions and writing about that. Um, so it's like half and half and but my poetry is definitely a way for me to process and feel and uh, reflect on however I'm feeling. It's usually a resolution to how I'm feeling. Understood. I um, I write as well, write poetry and I go through. I guess periods where I don't write and then periods where I'm just inspired and I do. And a lot of times it is very reflective of uh, sometimes a lot of times how I'm feeling, what I'm dealing with um, in my own life, relationships. It's a way of, of processing and releasing. Um, other times it has been very much about people who have inspired me, people mm -hmm. I've met and just a sort of impression they've made on me. And I, I write to kind of flesh that out there. Uh, and then now I've been um, more into, I guess, erotic. And that's a lot of like my thoughts okay. have kind of, and a lot of it is just, I just, I, I've always been, I think of a line, I just start talking and it just goes mm -hmm. from there until I'm done. And that's, that's it. That. And then I may go back and, and edit it. Um, now I just like record, I have like three or four I need to, write down kind of edit and see how i wanted to flow and, and redo it but that's and a lot of times they just come to me um in mm -hmm. inspiring ways and and yeah so i definitely get the poetry so who are some or do you have any favorite poets oh my goodness i don't okay i need to you know i uh... I was a homeschool kid, mm -hmm. so I didn't really have English classes uh, growing up. Um, I didn't go to school until I was uh, in high school, high school age. Right. So my knowledge of uh, of poets are actually minimal, and that's a little embarrassing to admit. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Trust me, no, it's not. I people. <laughs> I will say this in the end. But I even if I did have one, I would blank out on it. <laughs> so bad at names. Oh my goodness. Except being a bit older, I can even think of there aren't a lot of poets that I studied in school. Um, but the the most prominent one, which I've always loved and just loved his stories as well, and because I'm originally from Baltimore. Right. So I grew up right. in Baltimore. So we read Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> we yeah. read 
we read the Raven. I think the first poem ever was Annabelle Lee. We studied how we wrote, and then more uh, Black History Month, Langston Hughes and whatnot. So I got a lot of those guys, particularly a lot of my influences are Poe and then like Harlem Renaissance, because those are the poets that I probably studied the most, Langston Hughes, County Cullen. Um, and I think, I think it was high school is when Rita Dove was really big. And I know, I think I bought the book for my mom for Mother's Day or something like that back in high school. But again, those are just few and far between. And that's because of kind of where I grew up. Right. Well, so most people don't know who who poets are, <laughs> unless you're right. talking about Greek or Roman. But I, I always find it interesting, especially when people write, like, who are your inspirations? What do you draw from? Because I remember it was English class, sophomore year of high school. And again, this goes back to my Poe love. And I remember that my English teacher, she, she I always got to her for speaking because she always forced me to get up and speak now mind you, i went to always okay. high school so it's hard enough to speak and read poetry in front of a bunch of boys but I, she always pushed me to speak and read because she just really enjoyed what i wrote and she kind of propositioned me like hey why don't you write like the raven from the 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 raven's point of view sitting on Chalice's bus and mocking him and whatnot. And so I wrote this poem back in high school called Nevermore. And I need to find that book because it's in my garage somewhere. But yeah, I, love so that. I, I asked that just, just because of, of that and whatnot. So Scarlet Skies is, well, you have a look and you have a name uh, that mm -hmm. is, I would say, very, very good for branding uh, purposes. What do you look to, to do within the industry or even further within, say, the next couple of years? So I'm moving to the Valley right now. I'm in the process. Uh, after that's done, I'm going, I'm going to be doing so many collabs in the future. I'm really looking at elevating um, a lot of my own content that I own and produce. So I want to start looking into videographers and having that be a more frequent thing, getting sets, um, working with the uh, talent that I love to work with build my roster up. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to do uh, film and produce my first gang bank in the next year. Okay. Um, and I want to own that. And I also want to film and produce my first and only anal video and own that. So I'm just trying to work my way up a roster of uh, people that I really enjoy their work, mm -hmm. um, you know, crew wise. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited. I'm right at the very beginning of the planning process, but that's what I'm most excited about is just my own content and really like putting all of my energy and time into it, um, especially now when I'm moving closer to everybody. I think that's and one of the things I've seen just from all of my interviews and even just watching how say DIY, not DIY, direct to consumer has really changed so many industries, the adult industry specifically, and that ownership part is really key, uh -huh. uh, especially now um, with so much, much like music and streaming, so much of, of that is diluted through streaming, so much of that and that content is diluted, not just from a sheer quantity aspect, but from a, a dollar standpoint, because of all of the tube sites, so to speak, so your tube sites and, and whatnot. So uh, I can own, and then you guys, it's pretty much pay to play. You, you get your performance fee, you don't get any residuals, anything like that. Right. So once you, once you perform, that's it. There's no cut of residuals or anything like that. So it's gone. Whatever money is made off of that scene, that movie, what have you, all belongs to the company. So it becomes really important for performers really to own their own content to see that continued revenue stream come into play and that's also why i asked like what else are you looking to do right. uh, you know as far as plan wise because that's that's very important to a longevity of any career especially when you know you're pretty much you're selling yourself you are the brand right and you can't have all of your eggs in one basket absolutely right. and especially in any type of industry uh entertainment industry related uh career 
Um, I think it's super important. Uh, that's why I have my OnlyFans. I have my Fansly. Um, and I'm actually, I have my many vids. I'm actually trying to get on clips for sale and uh, sheer. There's just like so many and you you just never know. Um, you know, so it's good to always venture out and have more than one thing. You can't just uh, rely on performance and studio pay, especially when studio pay has been pretty much the same rate for year after year after year. How much is like an average pay for a young lady performer? Uh, starting. Yes. Uh, so say it's your first year in porn. Uh, girl girl rate would be 800 and a boy girl rate would be 8,000. And how long could you be on a set for a scene? You know, some days are short. Some days would be just four hours, but some days can be like 10, 11 hours. But I would say the average would be around six to eight hours. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, that's not a bad rate, but also no. I'm thinking that's not something you can do every day. And that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, it takes a, a toll on your body, especially if you are putting that kind of work in for that many hours with, and, and again, it's not like you're with a content creator partner and you're just filming for your OnlyFans. There's a lot right. more involved in it, um, stress mentally, physically. So yeah, so I- There's it, a lot more sex. So yeah. a lot more physical exertion of energy, yeah. you know, it is, you are having sex for hours, which right. like, you know, is fun and okay. Uh, but yeah, it is interesting uh, that the rate has stayed the same throughout the years. Um, but that's why I think it's so important that so many performers are now like speaking up and they mm -hmm. are requesting uh, raises, you know, um, they are taking content into their own hands. They're, they're not relying on just studio work. And I love studio work and I will always back my studio work, but uh, I think it's okay to also want good for yourself and your own brand, because that also brings money to the companies as well. Right. when you have a good brand yourself. Exactly. And it also raises your asking price as well when you work with the companies. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I just, I feel like people should definitely get paid uh, what they deserve. Um, especially, um, yeah, especially since we don't get residuals. Right. Yeah, it's it's every conversation I have, I just find it even more and more fascinating um, as far as the industry. And I won't say how people cope, but how, <clears throat> excuse me, individuals maneuver uh, within the industry and really try to carve out their own niche uh, in a market that, again, from the outside looking in, seems very saturated but once you really look at it those that really create really good content content that really attracts people and garners attention those yeah. individuals are few and far between i'll put it that way right in many respects um, i have one last question for you this is something that i thought about really when i when i saw you um you are a petite young lady and one of the things again I was coming from outside looking in and what, say, the image of what a woman in the adult industry would or should look like. And again, I am a man of a certain age, so I know that has changed. But as I was coming up, there is like a cookie cutter, especially for a, a Caucasian woman. Like there's a cookie cutter sort of way you look and people got this and that to try to get more money. Have you experienced any pressures to change yourself for the industry, physically speaking, to maybe get more roles or to get more money? You know, I have, I really have, but I feel like I am at a place and I am comfortable within myself that I don't listen too harshly to that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe the result would have been different had I joined the industry when I was younger, more impressionable. Right. Uh, personally, me, you know, like ex homeschool kid, very impressionable. Um, I feel like I got into the industry when I was actually in a really good mindset. It was something that I thought about for a while. Um, and I already went through the journey with my body, specifically my boobs, mm -hmm. where I used to do do want implants. And then I realized that 
I, I, I didn't want it for the right, right reasons. Right. Um, and honestly, like joining the industry has helped me a lot with my self-confidence because it's the things that I used to be most insecure about that are my greatest assets in this industry that I get the most compliments on. When I had my braces, that was a kink. It was a whole niche. Um, my ginger hair, people love that. Right. My petite frame, people love that. My boobs, people love it. And it, the industry and having friends in the industry that all look so different and are all so successful has really shown me that everybody is beautiful and every, there's always a demographic for everyone. So exactly, you might as well yes. Love everything you have because, like, it's all about how you feel about yourself. A hundred percent. It's about how you feel about yourself. I think that point you made about <clears throat> it being a demographic for everybody. I think that the ex and I'll say the explosion of all of the direct to consumer sites, all of the uh, mini vids, OnlyFans fan sites, <laughs> really speaks to that because I remember back in the day, and this is college, and you know when you go to a college in like a small area, it's a video store and you know, they got that area in the back and yeah. you go just to see what's there and you see the standard stuff and then you see sort of the oddball sort of stuff and it just looks, not that it is weird, it looks weird because it's directly presented that way on a video cover box. It's, it's made right. to really catch your attention and make it look weird. But with, this new economy and this new a way of of one we all have phones now that can produce our own videos movies and and, and whatnot so we all have the capability to create whatever of a film content we want to it is interesting and a fact of again going back to their human sexuality that human sexuality and human interest in sex and sexuality is so broad and diverse by the individuals like yourself who are vastly different even just look at the people i've been able to interview in a year the past year everybody's so different um the fact that there's a market and that in theory hopefully everybody is making a living off of what they're doing and they are you know connecting with fans building a community exploring other opportunities because we all like different flavors of everybody and that's a, a very interesting and i hope somebody does like a study on that someday as far as the sort of sociological aspects of it because i think it's absolutely amazing i think it's a more of a unifier than it is a divider in that respect no absolutely i think it's so fascinating 100 um, percent um I've thought about going back to school just to study sexology, honestly, like in the way future. I always want to do sex work no matter what, though. Um, getting into it made me really realize that, like, I am happy here in this industry, whether it be performing behind the camera, um, editing, um, anything. I love it. I, I find that very refreshing. And especially those comments, because I think when you don't have these conversations, everyone thinks about the horror stories. Everybody thinks about, and again, we still have untimely deaths of, of people in the adult industry even now, but you, you kind of think of them again. I'm a man of a certain age, so I remember when you didn't have the glitz and glamour. It is It was very much uh, synonymous with uh, young ladies like yourself getting in the industry and being basically chewed up and spit out and right. you know a life of misery and being taken advantage of and this and that to hear so many performers generally happy with what they're doing mm -hmm. and i feel as though that there is and, and maybe this is more of a result of, of, of only fans and and not only specifically but you guys build more of a connection because you're doing more content yourselves um, right. It's not all in the hands of the the studio. So it seems like to me, just in my interactions and my talking with people over the over the past year or so, that there are many tight knit 
groups and community or I mean, with, within the industry. And I think a lot of it is because of, oh, now everybody's really, you're really working for yourself. You can really call yeah. your shots in many respects. So you have to build those networks. You have to build those bonds of friendship, those, whether it's interpersonal or it's professional, like there's still that community that has to be built. And I, I don't think again, from the outside looking in, we really saw something like that 10 years ago, even. Right. No, and I hear that the industry back in the early 2000s was just so much different than how it is today. Um, I feel like uh, a lot of things specifically on porn sets, from what I hear, changed uh, after the Me Too movement. Mm. Um, prior to that, I heard, uh, you know, the industry just, you know, wasn't as clean. Right. Um, wasn't as regulated. But since I've been in there, um, and that's actually what a fear of mine was, but it's what kept me away from the industry for so long is because I thought it was going to be some dirty old man with a camera, you right. know, in the back alleyway, you know. Um, it wasn't like that at all. There's so many super professional sets, uh, so many witnesses there. There's paperwork, uh, there are cameras, there's cuts. Uh, it's It was nothing like uh, how I always heard heard the media portray the industry right and that's not to cr not criticize the industry because of course there are also a lot of issues with the industry uh, i would just like to highlight my own personal um overall experience that i do love um the studio work i've done and i've had really good experiences and they've overshadowed uh the the less good ones i've had right i i your, your comments are, are really on point because I think mm -hmm. that if I rec remember correctly, I think that last big HIV scare was around like early 2000s. Right. And there was, uh, you, you would think like I'm a student in the industry. I just remember these things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was, and, and I know like California mandated condom use and that kind of went out the window. Right. Uh, but I think a lot of it is really the technology, the technology to do that testing became cheaper. Um, it became more widespread. When there's a, a vacuum or a niche, you know, some business or businesses will fill it and that became a, a vacuum and needed to be filled because of everything was going on. Um, and now that's one of the things that I hear um, all the time, just as far as, and not just here, but from following so many people in the industry, I always hear about testing and where to get it and, and what to do and, and, you know, having it now the apps for it and you can show it and it's, it's amazing the how much it has changed even just the past 20 years or so yeah um as far as the, the the safeness of it the you know you can go into a set and realistically don't have to worry because you know everybody's been tested more than likely depending on where everybody's been tested in the same place by the same labs by the same people there's a chain there so you know if something happens Everybody knows the source to go back to as far as the testing is concerned. Um, and if there was some sort of mix up or issue and also. Depending on people's what they do outside the industry, there's a chain as far as, you know, what happened with individuals who has what, who doesn't have what, you know, you can. You can really pinpoint that and that is something again, thinking back to that scare 20 so years ago. Yeah. There were so many rumors and, and things going around about how people got it, where they contracted it, because they, they couldn't really tell. So I think that's absolutely amazing. I think, honestly, that helps to really create a safe community at, at the foundation of everything. And then everything else just built upon that. And we just keep getting better and better with the testing. Like, I love the fact that uh, Clear, Clear Testing now has a QR code. Um, which is great because there are unfortunately people that still fake their tests and try mm. to get paid for fake tests. And so it's, uh, which has happened like twice very publicly in the industry in like the last month. Wow. Uh, yeah, really. It's really crazy. People are still trying to get away with it. Um, so Clear's really been enforcing like the QR codes. So it, it's always a good uh, idea to, uh, have and everything but like you said like we're getting so much better and that's why like 
in the industry since I've been in, we've probably gone through three moratoriums, mm -hmm. moratoriums. Um, and that's because when there was an outbreak, it got caught and we stopped performing. Right. Um, it's so important to stick to the testing protocols. Uh, super important. Um, I know firsthand uh, just because I've I've literally been hospitalized uh, because of a fake test. So uh, oh, wow. very, very important. But that was something that did not happen during studio. That was a collaboration. And right. that was again because I didn't know uh, how to verify properly mm -hmm. at the time, you know, but yeah, testing is overall so much better. And I'm so happy that now there are better ways to verify and it can prevent that situation from happening to other people in the future. Right. It's, it's fascinating. It just is crazy to think somebody just goes through the effort of faking a test like if it's something that you can get rid of, then just wait yeah. it out, man. Just wait it out. Like I think the thought process is that they're clean and that they don't want to like chalk up some money for a test because they think that they're clean. It's still and not it's smart. Like, it's just like you don't know if you are clean. It's, yeah. There's incubation periods. There's a reason we say two weeks. Right. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Well, Scarlett, I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to let you go. Um, let everybody know where they can find you. All of my links are on my website, scarletskiesxxx.com. That's Scarlet with one T. Thanks, Scarlett. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you for your listening here. Remember, stay safe out there and be blessed. Bye. <laughs>